I am going to start with the sound. This is the sound of Wikipedia. It is uh, showing you the live edits to wi Wikipedia as they are happening right now across 30 or so languages. Um, what you see is basically the article names that are uh, being edited by the editors. Um, and you see the additions and removal of content or reversion of content. Uh, you see edits by editors who are logged in in green and uh, those which are by anonymous editors in white. And you see the bot activity in purple. So I'm showing this usually at the beginning of the presentations to say that Wikipedia is a living system. It is there and it's changing as we speak and, and as we are trying to figure out what to do to help it improve. I'm also sh sharing it to say that there is an enormous amount of good faith and volunteer work that is happening behind the project. Even the screen that you're seeing is the result of a de a three, two developers and one designer who worked at their volunteer time to make this happen. Um, so with this, I'll start talking about my presentation. I'm just gonna reduce the volume, sadly, and even maybe close it. To talk with you about research at the service of free knowledge. Um, so as Michael said, um, my name is Leila Zia. I am the head of research at Wikimedia Foundation, and I have the opportunity to work with six amazing research scientists and design researchers to do this. Uh, actually, today, we have two of the research scientists in the room. Martin and Miriam are in the room. They are visiting from Berlin and London. We have Wikimedia Foundation has the all hands meeting next week. So more of our employees are coming from all over the world to San Francisco uh, to meet during the next week. Uh, before I go to the details of the presentation, I should say that what I will say is not the views of my employer necessarily, and definitely not necessarily the views of Wikimedia com community and volunteers. So please consider that in what you hear. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about uh, a project that started in 2001 uh, with a humble goal of becoming an online encyclopedia that anyone can edit uh, and access for free. The Humble Project has turned to the largest encyclopedia that humankind has ever built, has uh, resulted in almost 50 million articles that today exist in Wikipedia, in more than 280 languages, with 10 million monthly edits, and you saw some of them just now as they were coming in, and 15 billion monthly page views. On top of all, it's a project that is run and governed by volunteers. So roughly there are 200,000 registered and 300,000 unregistered volunteers who contribute to the project. And these are the people who day in and day out make Wikipedia happen. Uh, Wikipedia over the past years has turned into a major entry point for learning for us. We go to Wikipedia for a variety of reasons. Uh, we did actually, we did a research to figure out why people come to Wikipedia. And what we learned is that there are people have different motivations when they come to Wikipedia. We go there if we are intrigued um, by a topic that we want to learn more about, or we are bored and or randomly want to explore a topic. We have a conversation with someone and we want to follow up on a fact. Uh, we read something or we see something in movies and we want to follow up and see what's happening on Wikipedia. We have a worker re school related project. There's a current event, there is a disease, there's an outbreak, there is an attack. There are personal decisions that we wanna make about what medical content, what medical treatment we should, um, we should use. And for all of these reasons from across the world, we go to Wikipedia and we expect to see answers and we expect to see reliable answers. But Wikipedia is not only used by humans. Wikipedia is used by machines um, to build algorithms and by platforms to develop other products on top of the high quality data that is being gathered by hundreds of thousands of volunteers in Wikipedia. Um, this doesn't need really major introduction to you, so I'll pass by this one relatively quickly, but a lot of the technologies that we use today 
while we think that we're not going to Wikipedia, they're actually empowered by the data that exists in Wikipedia. Thanks to the high quality data, technologies like Siri, Apple Watch, the knowledge bases that you see, um, the knowledge panel that you see in Google, a lot of them are at least receiving uh, some content from Wikipedia, and then some of them are completely relying on the Wikipedia or data that exists in Wikidata. Um, this kind of usage of Wikipedia is kind of advancing further and further. You see even platforms such as Facebook or YouTube using Wikipedia as a source to direct traffic of viewers of their videos to try to understand um, if, uh, to help them understand about and learn more about controversial topics. So a humble project which was supposed to be an online encyclopedia that anyone can freely edit and access for free is now becoming more and more responsible from the platform's pers perspective to handle some of these bigger challenges um, that the world faces. Um, and by the way, Wikipedia editors have pretty strong perspective on this front. Wikipedia is uh, based on verifiability and not truth, and we don't recommend um, linking to Wikipedia for truth searching. Um, so all of this to say that uh, Wikipedia has become a centerpiece of um, our world. Whether we go to it directly or not, um, we use it in our everyday, everyday life in a variety of ways. And to some extent, it has become sort of the epistemic backbone of the web. And as a result, it's really important to understand what is this project and how we can help to improve it or empower the editors to improve it. I will briefly talk about the role of Wikimedia Foundation as a kind of an elephant in the room, and I'll pass um, this one slide quickly. Uh, Wikimedia Foundation is the foundation that operates Wikipedia. Um, it is a nonprofit organization. We are around 380 employees, mostly remote, um, meaning um, the headquarters is in San Francisco, but we primarily don't work from the San Francisco office. Um, our job is not to um, interfere with the content on the projects. That, that's the job of the volunteer editors. And um, we also do not enforce policies, for the most part, on the projects. It is the responsibility. Um, and the governance model of Wikipedia for editors to decide what policies need to go on the projects and how they are going to implement them. If they need help, they will ask for help. Uh, what we do primarily is basically supporting uh, this community and this, uh, surfacing of the content across the globe. So we basically maintain the data centers, um, we have servers, we have a legal team that supports the community, we have a communications team and also a research team and product teams that build certain types of uh, products. And with that, I'm gonna talk briefly about the context we are operating right now in. Uh, we have a global multilingual project which is run by volunteers, um, which has a really radical objective. And this radical objective um, creates a lot of work for these volunteers. The objective <laughs> is to empower everyone in the planet to be able to share in the sum of all knowledge. And as much as we like to think otherwise, empowering people to share in the sum of all knowledge can be considered very radical. Um, the, the project has uh, created, a, created a significant reliance uh, by algorithms and platforms for coming to the project and developing the next levels of technology. There is the need to reach more people and more audiences, and also there's a need on behalf of the project to include more people. So primarily Wikipedia has been um, has been built uh, by the contributions of the people, again, primarily in global north and western part of uh, North America and western part of Europe. And there's a big desire to change this dynamic, to diversify the editor pool and be able to open up as a community and bring more people into Wikipedia and help them contribute to the project. And the last thing I want you to remember that there's a nonprofit behind the project, right? Beyond the volunteers who do the amazing work, at the end of the day, there's a nonprofit project that is responsible for servers and kind of the basics of the operations. And this is the context in which um, we talk about the research in Wikipedia. I say this component, uh, the context at the beginning to say that um, we are a small team of researchers. My team is a team of six plus one researchers who focus on Wikipedia. So you can imagine at the scale of Wikipedia with the kind of problems that you're already guessing that we're gonna talk about, there's gonna be a lot of demand for this small team. So part of our work is to make sure we empower researchers like yourself to be able to become volunteer researchers for Wikipedia. 
or at least empower other people, for example, developers, to t by releasing data sets and doing, putting APIs out and making it, the results of our work publicly available, kind of uh, find the knots that can empower, by unknotting them, we can empower more people to contribute to the project. Uh, primarily in the research team, we focus on three areas of research. Um, you can, there's a link to the white papers that we have for each of these, and you can learn more about them if you're interested. We focus on addressing knowledge gaps, which is about identifying what are the knowledge gaps on Wikimedia projects and finding ways to address them. I'll go through a few examples of the work that we do in this space. The other one is around improving knowledge integrity, which is about the reliability and quality of the content on Wikipedia and ways for assuring the quality and also improving the quality that exists on the project. And the last one is about the building the foundation, doing the foundational work that is needed, for example, releasing data sets or building relationships with researchers in academia and industry across the globe or other ways to basically expand the network of researchers and developers that exist around Wikipedia, and through that basically build a strong foundation for the project to survive from, uh, to continue surviving uh, on the development and research perspective. I am not going to talk about the last component, which is building the foundations today so much. I'll briefly mention a few ways you can engage. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna focus on the first two. And on the first two, um, there's a lot I can talk about. So I thought maybe I can uh, drill down on one or two examples a little bit more um, and um, make sure that I leave enough time for you all to ask questions because usually most of the exciting things happen in Q&A, not in the presentation, at least not in my presentation. <laughs> So I'm gonna talk about um, addressing knowledge gaps first. Um, this, uh, the work that I'm gonna talk about is in collaboration with GESIS in Germany, EPFL in Lausanne and Stanford. Um, and I'm gonna talk with you first um, about what we envision as the primary direction for the knowledge gap space. So we wanna identify as Wikimedia's knowledge gaps. This means we wanna understand what content we are missing, but not only content, who are we missing in terms of readership and contributorship. And we also wanna understand what is the relationship between these different entities? What is the effect of missing certain types of contributors? What happens if we don't have enough women on Wikipedia? Does it have impact on readership or not? And how does it reflect itself if it has? The other thing that we want to uh, be able to do is to measure and prioritize missing content. Um, this actually turns out not to be an easy task. What is missing from the projects is sometimes easy to measure and in many times is not because it requires speaking to the bodies of knowledge that exist outside of Wikipedia and having ways for prioritizing this missing content. Um, we wanna be able to address these knowledge gaps and actually the first project that I'm gonna talk with you about is gonna kind of touch on the first uh, three bullet points. Um, and the last thing, which is kind of a, on a more ambitious front, uh, we wanna be able to build a knowledge gap or a knowledge equity index. So we wanna be able to have an index um, that can help decision maker at the, let's say, uh, higher leadership level across the movement to be able to look at this index and say, these are the areas that we should invest in or we should pay more attention to. More directional, it's not uh, meant for day-to-day -day operation purposes. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about uh, the first project. This is, uh, I need to explain this map maybe a little bit before digging deeper. Um, so this is the map of the world. Um, each point that you see on the map, if it's blue, it means that there is one Wikipedia article about that uh, coordinate on Wikipedia, right? And if it's um, yellow, it means there are two or three, and if it's um, white, it means there are at least 10 articles about that coordinate on Wikipedia. This is not the representation of all knowledge that can exist on Wikipedia because a lot of knowledge is not, cannot be associated with coordinates. The reason that I'm showing this to you is that it gives you a sense of how much we are missing content on Wikipedia. So this is English Wikipedia. If English is the only language you speak, this is how much you can learn about the world in terms of things that coordinatable. Um, now let's switch to Russian Wikipedia. Um, with uh, 250 million native speakers. This is how much you can learn. Um, Spanish Wikipedia is not much better, and I wanna bring your attention to the fact that uh, obviously closer to Spain, you see a lot of activities and um, 
um, creation of articles happening, but you would expect a lot of this to happen in South America as well, and that's an area that we are missing um, a lot of content. Again, this narrow, specific type of content. Uh, Portuguese is not better, and Arabic is pitch dark, right? I mean, you have some areas that, are, um, that we know more about, but pretty much it, it's, it's a dark map. Um, this doesn't become better or much better when you overlay the maps, right? When you overlay the maps, meaning if you speak all the languages that exist um, in Wikipedia, close to 300, you still have a lot of missing points. It's closer to English than um, a complete map of the world. So this made us uh, think uh, back in 2014, 2015, and 2016 about this topic of how can we grow, how can we help editors grow Wikipedia faster? Um, we're definitely growing it. There's a lot of contributions. You saw it as they were coming, but it seems it's not fast enough. Part of the work that you can do is on basically working on efforts to bring more editors on the projects. But the other effort that we focused on was can we build a system that can automatically detect what, what content is missing in Wikipedia, prioritize it, and recommend it to editors? And that's what we basically built. Um, we tried to find the articles um, that are missing from Wikipedia, and the way we did it is that we uh, chose the easier path, which is comparing Wikipedia languages with each other, uh, figuring out in, if an article exists in one language but is missing in another language. So we didn't search outside of the Wikipedia space. Um, and we found, um, let's say at the time on um, English Wikipedia, we had three million articles, and in French we had 1 to 1.2 million articles. So we, so we found 1.8 million articles that existed in English, could potentially exist in French Wikipedia, but were missing at the time in the, in the project. Um, but then, of course, not all those 1.88 million are high priority for French Wikipedia to have those articles. Some of them, actually, the French Wikipedia community may decide they don't want to have articles about it because the notions of notability can differ across projects. So what we did is that we built a ranking model to rank how important the article is for that project. Um, and the ranking model would basically predict how many page views the article would receive if the article were to be written in French Wikipedia, let's say. Right. Um, by the way, a lot of interesting discussions around whether page views is a good metric there or not, but that's what we use. Um, and then we did a relatively simple uh, matching problem. So we built topical models for editors based on their edit history. We built topical models for articles that are missing in a language, given that they exist in another language, and then we solved the matching problem. Um, we did an experiment uh, where we invited uh, 12,000 editors who spoke both French and English, or who had contributed to both French and English Wikipedia to participate in the experiment. We took the top 300,000 articles um, on the ranked list of articles that we saw. We divided them into three groups, a held back group, and one group that was assigned at random to, the, to 6,000 of the uh, editors, and the top group that uh, in which we did the personalization, which is tuning, basically doing the matching, as opposed to just assigning editors randomly to the articles. And what we saw that um, it was that if you do personalized recommendations, you can increase article creation rate by a factor of almost 3.2 without compromising on quality. This was a big result back then. Um, it's always um, nice to get this kind of results in, in experiments, but experiments always have their uh, drawbacks and caveats. Um, so what we did is that we set up a, a research tool, which is still up and you can go and, uh, and play with. But more importantly, we made a production API um, out of this uh, model. Actually, we simplified the model further because for pro productionizing this across 300 languages, basically pairs that you need to consider, we needed to do a lot more work. So we simplified the ranking step and the matching step and uh, we surfaced the API publicly. There are some uh, developer tools that are using this API today. Uh, one point that I want to say is that the content translation tool within Wikimedia Foundation picked up the API and decided to use it. And uh, back then, the content translation tool was kind of in very limited use. So we had around like 50 um, articles created per week. And after the adoption, we were seeing within the period of two to three months, we were seeing 1,500 articles being created every week. Um, and then more recently, when we looked at the statistics, what we could see is that 
roughly more than 20% of the new translations are coming through the suggestions that are coming from the API. Um, we didn't do any further A-B tests. Uh, this is uh, mostly just looking at what, what the split of translations are right now. So this is one example to say that um, Sometimes the kind of work that we do relatively smoothly ends up in production. And when it ends up in production, it can actually end up empowering the editors that are contributing to the projects. Um, what we realized after this project was that it was not enough to do recommendations to editors uh, for creating articles. What can happen is that you can recommend for an article to be created, and in practice that article remains a stub on the project. Um, stubs are very short articles which are deemed not to be encyclopedic, basically, from the editor's perspective. Um, so if, you, if the editors take the job very lightly, they can take your recommendation, put a title page in the language, write a one-liner, done, and then you have achieved um, creation of one article. In fact, uh, what we saw is that 37% of English Wikipedia articles are stubs. Uh, these are uh, articles that are considered non-encyclopedic by the definition of editors, and they need to be expanded um, to remain on, on the encyclopedia for the longer term. And this um, English Wikipedia is already uh, one of the better cases of Wikipedias in terms of uh, development of content on the project. So what we decided to do is um, go deeper than the article level. So instead of recommending what articles to create, how about we take the stubs that already exist on Wikipedia and recommend what sections to be added to the already existing articles on Wikipedia. Um, this is how the tool will eventually, maybe someday, will look. Um, we did one line of work with uh, Tiziano Piccardi and Michele Catasta and uh, Bob West, which was around using focusing on a Wikipedia language in a, in a, in a specific language, and then um, using the information in that language from the category network of Wikipedia, extracting, extracting information about the different sections that, it, that can exist in, the, in, that category, in the articles that belong to that category, and basically doing simple fre frequency counting. And what we could see is that at pre we could achieve a precision at 10 of around 80%, which was reasonable. The challenge we faced then was that if you are in a smaller language where the category network is not developed or well developed, what should happen then? One idea would be to take the category network from English Wikipedia and then send it to that language. And this line of work receives a lot of resistance. So there is, a, um, there is good arguments to be made that the diversity of expression of content on Wikipedia um, across languages is something that we want to preserve. So taking a structure of the category network from a large language, let's say, such as English Wikipedia, and putting that in smaller languages is not desirable from the cultural and cultural representation perspective. So we are working actually on um, a different approach at the moment um, to address this problem for the medium size and smaller um, size languages. Um, I don't have results to show at the moment until we push the work further out. Um, I am going to switch to readership, which is another uh, thing I wanted to talk with you about uh, today in the context of addressing knowledge gaps. Um, we started doing a bunch of work in this space starting around 2016, and back then what we realized is that we know very, li very little about the readers of Wikipedia. Um, because the editor data is primarily publicly available, researchers have had access this, to this data basically from the very early days of Wikipedia. So you see a lot more research and development and understanding around what editors do on the projects, while the readership aspect is pretty much unknown. So we started the first line of work around why we read Wikipedia, where we attempted to build a taxonomy of um, Wikipedia use cases. And then from there, we ran surveys on English Wikipedia, and we asked people basically to help us get a sense of what is the representation of readership across these use cases. Um, maybe I should move forward. Um, yeah, I'll explain this here. We built the taxonomy. Um, and then in 2017, 2018, what we did is that we took the taxonomy that we uh, developed in 2016 and 17, and we ran these surveys in 14 languages. Um, in Wikipedia, basically asking people about their motivations for coming to Wikipedia. You saw in the early slides, like uh, the motivation questions, the depth of knowledge that they're seeking in their visit, and whether they're familiar or unfamiliar with the topic that they're reading. Um, 
what we see um, through what we saw through the surveys that we r ran in a nutshell, um, one of the interesting results that we saw is that the country that the reader is in has impact on the use cases that Wikipedia has for that reader. Um, so generally what we saw is that if you come to Wikipedia from a country that has low human development index, which means lower socioeconomic status um, and also lower access to health and education, you tend to read Wikipedia articles more in depth. You also tend to read more um, scientific and less leisure oriented topics on, while you're on Wikipedia. And this is in contrast to if you're coming from countries which have very high human development index. Uh, so in these countries, you tend to have users that more do fact checking or coming for very quick reads of Wikipedia. And they also read Wikipedia more or they read more of leisure oriented topics on Wikipedia. And when I say leisure oriented, I mean sports, movies, um, that type of topic. Um, so what we decided to do in 2019 was to expand the study. And the main question that we had when we started this was on the country component. So we saw that there are differences between people when they're in different countries, but it's, it was not clear to us whether these differences are at the individual level or not, right? So if I'm an Iranian, sitting here in the Bay Area, is my behavior basically captured by the fact that I am in the US? Or is it I am carrying some something, some cultural or background with me that has impact on the way I use Wikipedia? So with this uh, last round of surveys, we're trying to get to the answer to that question. So we added some demographic questions to the surveys, and we also tried to um, sample more heavily from Africa um, to be able to understand that user population better. Um, here's how the surveys run. Basically, if you're selected to participate in the survey, you receive um, a pop-up that says, take a short survey and help us improve Wikipedia um, on mobile or desktop. And then if you say yes, then you will be taken to the survey to answer some questions. We collect the responses to the survey and then we join those with a bunch of other information that we have. One of them is that we know which article you were on when you responded to the survey. So we, we extract the information about the article from Wikipedia. And then um, we also have access to web request logs and that would allow us, that allows us to have information about session length and um, the, the geo coordination. Basically because we have the request information, we have the time of the day you, you connect that to Wikipedia what country you were connecting from, as much as your IP can speak to that, IT, uh, to that country. Um, and aggregated, we, we use all of this information to be able to make sense of the data that we received from the surveys. Um, we ran the 2019 surveys for one week. Um, and uh, I will come to the one week uh, right now to say that eventually we repeated it for one month as well to see if the result changes if we do it. And the short answer is no. Um, so we ran it in 13 languages, three motivation questions, and then five demographic questions around age, gender, education, the locale of the person, and their native language. Uh, and we connected, collected around 65,000 responses uh, from the readers of Wikipedia. Uh, I want to share with you some of the results, although it may look like um, just some statistics to share, to share with you maybe some of the challenges that Wikipedia faces and we face as we, under, we try to understand Wikipedia. Uh, so the first question we had was, are current Wikipedia readers representative of the population that the world has or that we think we, Wikipedia should have? Um, and this obviously has a lot of implications, um, the, the representation of readers. Uh, it has impact on the way we do product initiatives or do investments in different regions. And the short answer is no. Um, and maybe it's no all the time, um, but um, it was for us it was no in a surprising way. And uh, I'll move forward to show you those. Uh, so we asked the question about what is your age. On the x-axis, you can see the different languages that we have for French and English. We have two sets of responses from the world and from Africa specifically. And what you immediately observe is that the majority of the respondents in almost every language were less than 25 years old. Um, and German and Norwegians are exceptions in, in this case. Um, we see some spikes um, in 
or drops in Spanish and Hebrew, um, and we think that maybe the school session, school was in se session during that time. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that this immediately raises some questions for us. So we see that a lot of population is actually really young, but as researchers, we have limitations on who we can ask questions of. Um, so generally, in many countries, uh, users under age 18 are considered minors. So what we do in these surveys is that the first question you receive is your age. And if you say that your age is under 18, you basically are sent to the last page. Um, and if you are over 18, then you participate in the rest of the survey. But here, one challenge we have is moving forward, knowing that a lot of our population, uh, the current reader population is young. There's a question of what do these people want? What do they want to take out of Wikipedia? And we haven't figured out a good way to answer that question yet. The other question is, what is your gender? And uh, maybe I'll take a couple of guesses before showing this. What do you think the gender distribution would be? And just to keep it kind of very simple here, we asked uh, four, we basically had four options for responses. Men, women um, prefer not to say, or neither of the two. Um, and I'm gonna show you only the man and woman split. It's readership, right? 50-50. 50 50, 50-50, okay, let's do it. Um, it's not 50-50 and it's, it's pretty, <laughs> um, yeah, we wanna understand why. So the majority of the respondents in almost every language seem to be men. Um, and one thing I didn't uh, actually mention earlier that I should have is that we do, a, as much as we can, we take, um, we do debiasing steps on these surveys. So as, as I showed uh, to you, we collect a lot of features and through these features we do the uh, weighted uh, propensity score matching and we do debiasing. So what you're seeing here is actually, as much as we could, the debiased results from the survey. Um, yeah, so this is what's happening on uh, Wikipedia in terms of readership in these projects. Maybe one good news that I'm not showing here is that um, we also looked at this data across age groups and what we are seeing is that um, in younger age groups, the split um, is very close to 50-50 and as people age, basically the split grows. Um, this can mean many things. It can mean that, oh, we fixed the problem and the newer generations are not gonna have this problem or it can mean that as women, age and they have other social responsibilities in life, we're gonna see this issue in, um, in this currently younger generation later on as well. Um, how many years of full-time um, education um, that people have had? Um, so generally 13 to 16 years of education is what's happening in the, in the, readers, uh, in the readership of Wikipedia. This is, we have the country information from other um, data sets that are publicly available that can help us understand that this is, on, in general, on average two to four more years more than the average education of the people in these countries. Um, and um, this has implications, right? As, as we're thinking about including more people, having content that is more accessible to more people, thinking about um, the fact that you need 16 years of education before being able to communicate with the content or interact or learn from it. Um, obviously, I'm not suggesting that that's the only reason. I mean, there may be many reasons that people don't end up on Wikipedia, but um, this is something good for us to keep in mind. And with this, I'm gonna maybe skip a couple of slides um, just to talk with you about this part, which is about whether readership gaps um, and content gaps on Wikipedia are related. Um, this is um, early results and we are seeing some signals that these may be related. More specifically, what we are seeing is that in many of the languages, so what you see um, here on the left-hand side, it basically on Arabic Wikipedia, you see the first left, most left bar is men reading about men, then you have we, women reading about men, and then women reading about women, and women reading reading about women, sorry, reading, men reading about women and women reading about women. So what you see here is some early signals that in many languages, men read relatively more frequently about men and women read more frequently about women. And this is just focused on the biographies um, of men and women on Wikipedia. Uh, what you also see that is that in almost all languages, younger readers 
read about people who are younger and older readers read about people who are older. Um, this early signals suggest that there's maybe more to it. Um, we don't have any definitive uh, claims to make here right now, but we are gonna be looking into this space more closely to try to understand the interactions between um, content and readership. Yep. Are these graphs that on the last slide on this one, are they adjusted for the relative prevalence of those kinds of biographies on Wikipedia? For they, example, they, they are, are not, not, yes, and that's, yeah, that's something that needs to be fixed. Are the prevalence, so like, I, I know that there's been studies finding that there are fewer female biographies Correct. on Wikipedia. So like, what is rough, I don't even remember, what is that? Yeah, and it like, changes, um, yeah. Ooh, you actually looked at this. Twenty percent. It has not changed much in the past. Okay. So it's like one in five. One, no, yeah. Well, because if you go back, like in that sense, it would suggest that you're almost like doing better than baseline. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's still like it's not a great situation. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This needs to be looked into further and normalizing definitely for the number of biographies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll move forward um, to talk with you maybe for a few minutes, and I'm not gonna go through a lot of details um, about um, this other, actually maybe I, I should talk about the open questions that we have in the, in the knowledge gap space before I go uh, to the next one. In terms of open questions in content, um, there's one question we have, which is how to find knowledge that is not already on the projects across languages, content types, and in a scalable way. What is our way for finding what is missing on Wikipedia? Um, the other one is that as we are thinking about looking at external knowledge sources and figuring out what's missing, it's important for us to think about the notability uh, component. Because at the moment, editors are making that first decision of, is this notable? I'm gonna write an encyclopedic content about it. And in the first research that I showed you, what we do is that we compare basically language editions with each other. So at least at the first entry of the knowledge to one Wikipedia language, an editor has made a choice that this is notable. If you go to the outside world, there is the question of, well, there's a lot out there. What is considered from the encyclopedic um, view notable to exist in an encyclopedia. Um, in terms of readership, um, there is a question about how can we address the imbalance of uh, readership uh, that we see. Specifically, I would uh, call out the case of gendered um, uh, imbalance that we are seeing. This is something that we need to get to the bottom of. There are more imbalances definitely that we see there, but I would say that's kind of the more acute one and is kind of the more visible one that we think we should be able to address. Um, how, do, how do people learn on Wikipedia? What do they actually do when they come on the projects? What is their trajectories and what does learning even mean and how do we measure it on, on Wikipedia? What is the role of visual knowledge? Uh, we talk a lot about text in this first part and there's a question that people have different, different learning moods and what it takes to bring more images to Wikipedia and or other types of media that can help people with different needs learn more smoothly while they're on the projects. And how are images are currently being used? Uh, what are the navigational patterns of readers on Wikipedia? Uh, in terms of contributorship, I would say we have a few questions here. One is that how do we help diversify the editor pool is something that I don't talk about here. It's an area that of immense interest to different stakeholders within the community. And on the more general part, what is the relationship between content readership and contributorship? What are the tension points? What are the places that one helps the other uh, or undermines the other? And how do we measure these knowledge gaps? I wanna leave enough time for you all to ask questions if you want to. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna pass through this next part relatively quickly, give you a gist of what's happening um, in the knowledge integrity front. Um, so the challenge that we have in this space is that we have readers that trust the content that they read on Wikipedia, and we see this through the qualitative studies that we do. Um, and we also see that they don't consult with citations as often as we hope to. Mm -hmm. So in the pages that have the references available to them, only one out of 200 page views results in a citation check, which we appreciate the trust, but from the editor perspective, they always want the reader to verify the content that they're, re that they're reading. Um, 
Every second, Wikipedia receives around five edits. That means a lot of edits that are coming in, and a lot of all of these edits will need to go through a lot of judgment calls. While when you make the edit, the edit becomes immediately av available to the world, it goes to a backlog of work for patrollers to check the edit. The edit needs to be checked in terms of neutrality or in terms of whether it's verifiable, whether you have provide sources, whether it's about somebody who is a living person, and uh, if the content doesn't have sources, then it's like immediately problematic. So my edit results in more work for others, and we are doing a lot of edits, which is a good thing. But then the issue is that also editors and administrators are really few in numbers. And there are also language barriers. While English, English Wikipedia has around um, a few hundred or a thousand administrators, this becomes very challenging if you go to smaller languages like Persian Wikipedia or Malagasy Wikipedia. Um, and the language becomes a barrier for the editors from other projects or admins from other projects to be able to come in and help if this language needs help in terms of um, maintaining the quality of content. And of course, um, there are organized groups governments who try to interfere with the content, right? So you have a volunteer base, very dedicated volunteer base, who has pushed the project for almost 20 years forward, and you have all these forces that sometimes are working with it and sometimes against it. Right? Uh, so generally, patrollers and administrators need to take a lot of decisions very quickly on Wikipedia. Um, their backlog is ever growing in many areas, especially in larger languages like English Wikipedia. And the question is we, that we have is how can we support them with the, with the technology that we can develop either within this team or outside of this team to support them to make some decisions more efficiently. So the direction that we go in this um, space of knowledge integrity is primarily focused on identifying, characterizing, and addressing the threats to the integrity of the knowledge on the projects, helping editors enforce, monitor and enforce their core content policies, verifying knowledge in the absence of secondary information, which is a big topic for us as we are trying to include more people with more forms of knowledge in the projects. There's a question of what if they don't have a secondary source available to back up their, um, their claim, um, and then also characterizing the integrity of multimedia knowledge, which is something we are relatively recently introducing to the, uh, to the team. Um, I think it's best probably for me to stop here um, and open it for questions. Um, uh, Michael, do you think it's good or? Yeah, you get five more minutes if you want. Okay. What do you all prefer? Talk or Q and A? Questions? Let's do questions then. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Right. Thanks, Leila. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remind you that all questions need to be put fully cited. <laughs> yes. I will not say. Or they will be reported. <laughs> Maybe I say one thing before I wrap this up. We have Wiki Workshop as part of the web conference uh, happening. If you're doing already work in the Wiki media space, that you're interested to come present in the workshop, our next deadline for submissions is February 2017. Um, that's the link for it, wikiworkshop.org. And credits, and thank you, yeah. I can take questions. <laughs> yes? This might be outside the scope, but I'm curious if you looked at what's required for a new wiki community to get off the ground, i.e. for Wikipedia a new language or something outside of it. Yeah, um, and I think this is something, it, First of all, this is outside of the area of my expertise. So what I will tell you is um, kind of based on my personal experience and what I'm observing happening in the other teams. Um, I think we, as Wikimedia Foundation, we don't have a lot of experience building new communities. We have maybe more experience, let me correct this, building new communities or empowering new communities in areas that no basic seeds exist. So. If you are living, let's say, in a country or a region that you already have, for example, open source advocates in your region, right? Or you already have some develop, developer skills. Um, you already have skills around like adding content digitization, like some basic infrastructure, if that exists, it's easier to start doing kind of the initial seed of investment, basically giving some small grants, trying to bring this community together. Um, in areas of the world where those seeds don't exist, um, I don't know even, uh, yeah, where would we start basically? 
Yes. Uh, can you just, uh, talk a bit about the governance model in terms of like who the editors are, how you do the disagreements, and sort of all, everything that goes around, like ultimately what will be in an article? Yes. Um, so it is, uh, it is very complex. Um, and it's very different. It can be very different from language to language. So what you see on English Wikipedia can be very different than what you see in Hindi Wikipedia. Um, and uh, generally, the way it works is that uh, for the most part, once you make the edit, your edit appears on, on the project and immediately visible to the readers. Um, as the patrollers review or if somebody flags the content as being problematic or attempts to revert, maybe two things can happen. One is that if a, if a patroller reviews your content and decides that there's a problem with this, they usually notify you um, and then you have some time to react and if you don't react then the content gets reverted or um, in some cases deleted. Um, it can get more complicated. Um, there are, let's say, in Wikimedia Commons, which is the media repository for Wikimedia Project, every time you upload an image on Wikimedia Commons, it needs to go under, let's say, for example, a free license, uh, um, free, free license, uh, license model. Um, you see sometimes photographers coming back and saying, I want to delete my image, right? And technically, something that you have published under the free license cannot be deleted, right? So sometimes some community conversations will need to happen about that specific case. Um, I would say on the edit cases, there are also cases in which like, there are a lot of wars like going back and forth, rever reverting each other. And at some points, admins can come in and lock the page. Um, if con the situation escalates in other articles, they can go through like <coughs> partial banning of the username if that username is logged in, banning the range of IP if they are not logged in, basically if it gets to vandalism and those kind of things. Um, and then there are arbitration committees and affiliation committees and like there's basically a, like a whole world behind this that depending on the case may kick in. So 4D is a controversial topics where there is a lot of uh, back and forth editing going on. The user may come in at any moment and only get exposed to one side of the story. Um, is there a way that to, uh, to inform the user that this is a controversial topic and then you should maybe come back later to check. Uh, um, so in theory, yes. In practice, it's been hard. So part of the issue is how to figure out whether this is controversial. And you would expect that you can go to the talk pages of Wikipedia. So every article you may know already has a talk page associated with it where editors discuss basically the things that are happening in that specific article. So. In theory, you should be able to build a model that can say which part of that talk page discussion is about which part of the article, and then maybe create some summaries of this is the status, or there are too many things happening, it's already a sign that something may be going on, and surfacing that to the, to the reader. Um, one of the challenges is that the talk pages are not structured, and um, analyzing the data and uh, doing the matching between the two is not obvious. But it's definitely a very interesting um, uh, area to, to look into. Um, the other thing I would say is that in talk pages, not only for the controversial topics, but when these controversies happen or, um, happen or when editors disagree, you get amazing outcomes out of those conversations that don't show up in the articles themselves, um, but are there in the talk pages. Like things as simple as how do you define a sandwich, right? Um, at the end, you go and read the article, but there's a lot of discussion about like how should be the bread and what are the specific specifications of that bread, right? And there's that wealth of knowledge is hidden currently in the talk pages. Um, and while maybe the sandwich is not the most interesting topic to you, there are other topics that can be more interesting. And I think definitely there needs to be much more work for looking at that data and linking it. There's also the question of um, how the bias spreads, for example, on the article page, and what is the relationship between bias spreading on the article page and what's happening on the talk pages, right? And what is the relationship there? Yep. I'm curious, you talked about the influence that Wikipedia has downstream uh, you know, on, other, on, on people and on bots and so on. And I'm wondering if you think it would be possible to measure the influence that it has sort of on how we discuss the topics that are covered in Wikipedia. You could imagine that if everyone's sort of centrally coming to a Wikipedia page to understand the topic, that 
how that's described could influence like public conversations around that topic in the same way that you know a, a news source can sort of set in some ways a conversation agenda. Like, do you think it would be possible to actually track that, or or do you feel that the the, the influence is actually coming in the other direction that it's happening elsewhere and then getting reflected on the media, yeah. like which is in or out? Mm -hmm. So there are um, two things maybe I can say immediately to your question. One is that on the science, uh, in the topic of science, there has been controlled studies that show that what happens on Wikipedia, the language in which science is described in Wikipedia then influences the academic uh, uh, language of how papers are being written. There was a controlled study in, uh, by folks in MIT a few years back that showed this. So there's definitely evidence that what happens on, Wiki, on, on Wikipedia has impact on the language, the way of thinking uh, in science, or at least in specific parts of science. Um, there is, related to your question, there's another kind of body of our work that uh, one person in our team, Isaac Johnson, has started on um, understanding how to measure reuse um, of content. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think understanding how, how to even figure out where the conversation is happening, which is related to the reuse question, is a first step before we can get to your question of, okay, now that, that we know how to find where the content is being discussed, now let's figure out what are, what are the types of conversations and what's happening, whether it's coming back to Wikipedia or not. Right. Yeah, you need to know where it started. Yes. But it's definitely very interesting. Um, uh, in your talk, you mentioned that there are organized groups that's trying to manipulate content mm -hmm. in the past. Can you give some, I guess, examples of uh, this? And also, um, is Wikipedia doing something to automatically detect this kind of thing, or is it just depend on? controllers. Yeah, so we have um, reports from the communities that in some of the languages there are government involvement in the project. There has been, and these are not all fully confirmed, but let's say for example in Persian Wikipedia there are discussions of, uh, about that. There's in, in Russian Wikipedia there are discussions uh, about that. Um, in the Chinese Wikipedia, um, ZH basically experienced some of this some years back. Um, there are also attempts that are not maybe directly done by the government, but um, are um, nevertheless attempts that weaken the project potentially. Um, for example, the recent case that um, uh, got resolved eventually was that the government of Turkey was requesting a change of content on Wikipedia and Wikimedia, Wikipedia editors didn't agree to the change and they said, well, no, these are like facts and uh, they're supported. Um, and uh, as a result, basically Turkey blocked the whole of Wikipedia for almost three years in Turkey, right? So basically 80 million people lost their access to the free knowledge, right? So there are, um, while uh, maybe they attempted, maybe not, but while they didn't change the content directly, um, there are consequences for governments um, appetite for changing the content and that these are not the only places. I'm sorry, you had a second part to your question or? So which is, is there any automatic way of detecting this kind of organized way to? Yeah, so one of the things that in the program that I much less talked about, uh, about uh, knowledge integrity, um, we would like to understand, um, we're doing one project with Srijan Kumar um, uh, and Yure here on sock puppet detection. Um, sock puppets are accounts that are operated by one person and a lot of, uh, at least some of the activities that we see which are organized, they create a lot of sock puppets on Wikipedia. So at least we know we can catch maybe some of them through uh, those methods. Um, and then the other one is we don't understand actually how this information spreads on the project. Uh, so we would like to start a line of research or two on this front to understand what are the mechanisms through which this information mostly organize this information spreading on, on the projects and then what can be done basically to stop them. Yes? Um, a lot of authoritarian governments are now using AI to uh, censor information. Has Wikipedia taken any steps to prevent censorship by AI? So there are uh, some things I can comment on, and that is if we see as, as a foundation, and this is primarily outside of my team's work, if we observe um, well, two things. One is the, the detection of it, and the detection is not very obvious, right? How do you detect that you're 
missing part of your population because if they do kind of complete block, it's relatively easy to understand. You're, you lose basically traffic from the country or region or, um, completely. But detecting is not obvious and that is something that uh, we have been working on on our end. And then once a the detection kind of confirms and uh, the local sources confirm that yes, there's something happening, then that's where usually the policy angle of uh, legal and policy angle of Wikimedia Foundation um, kicks in, right? And there's a lot of arguments to be made about access to knowledge as uh, a human right. Um, and that's the angle that that team tries to push and make cases um, for the different governments. Any other questions? All right. Oh, oh, we have one minute. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, is, has there been efforts to do translations to other languages? From like, as you mentioned in the beginning, English has the most translating to other languages. Uh, yeah, so the question was whether uh, there are opportunities for translation or efforts for translation from one language to, er to the other. So there's the, there are editors who do translation without any specific tools, but there's also the content translation tool that is developed by Wikimedia Foundation that editors use for doing translations. Um, specific um, topical areas um, of uh, Wikipedia organize around translations in certain ways. So for example, there's Wiki Project Medicine um, that basically they have as part of their vision to make sure that medical content is immediately available across many languages. And they do kind of very organized physicians sitting and doing kind of translation in, in these languages. Um, I would say just one thing to keep in mind as kind of the point that always comes back when we think about translation is, um, what do we lose when we do the translation, right? And which language we translate from to, and um, what is the proficiency of the people who are doing the translation, how much of the cultural context they keep as they do the translation. And there's definitely the tension between sometimes the need to bring the content to the reader as soon as possible. For example, if you have an outbreak, versus the need to preserve your culture and the way you represent and the way you learn and understand. And that's kind of uh, one of the topics of conversation usually around translations. Thank our speaker. Oh, thank you.